Good morning and welcome to worship this. I invite you to rise in body or spirit as we gather to meet with the Lord. We gather together as church to find God. Psalm 42 reminds us that we live in between these two experiences. First, my soul thirsts for the living God. And second, that question, where is your God? In worship, we discover that it is the glory of God to find us. The blood of Jesus reveals that we are saved by grace alone. And we are united in Christ's death and resurrection and transformed for life with the triune God. God's word gathers us in this assurance, sisters and brothers. You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. You are invited now to turn to one another and say the peace of the Lord be with you. join together in prayer, opening our true selves to God that the Spirit may receive us and by the blood of Jesus, you and I receive that assurance that we are completely forgiven of all our sins. Let us pray. Most holy and merciful Father, we confess to you and to one another that we have sinned against you by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not fully loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not always had in us the mind of Christ. You alone know how often we have grieved you by wasting your gifts by wandering from your ways, by forgetting your love. Forgive us, we pray you, most merciful Father, and free us from our sin. Renew in us the grace and strength of your Holy Spirit for the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. Yeah. 
to your spirit to sing. There's a wideness in God's mercy like the wideness of the sea. There's a kindness in God's justice which is more than Let us pray. Holy Spirit, grow within us a deepening trust in the Father and the Son and the Spirit in all things, fully submitting all our ways to you. So now let us take the Savior at his word and receive now this word of God to us, that by it, we may find mercy, and we may be healed and comforted and strengthened as your disciples. In Jesus' name, amen. The fourth act of faith in the discipline of lament is to place your trust in the trying God. We have said from the start that lament is about more than being really sad. Today we say lament is not to be forever. When we have turned to God in our sorrow and loss, then brought our heartfelt complaints to the loving and kind Heavenly Father, and then boldly asked the deepest desires Jesus placed in our heart, we are ready to choose to trust in the Lord for our well-being. Lamentations 4, 1, 11 through 13, 20, and 22. How the gold has lost its luster, the fine gold become dull, the sacred gems are scattered at every street corner. The Lord has given full vent to his wrath. He has poured out his fierce anger. He kindled a fire in Zion that consumed her foundations. The kings of the earth did not believe, nor did any of the people of this world, that en enemies and foes could enter the gates of Jerusalem. But it happened because of the sins of her pr prophets and the iniquities of her priests who shed within her the blood of the righteous. The Lord's anointed, our very life breath, was caught in their traps. We, we thought that under his shadow we, we would live among the nations. Your punishment will end, daughter Zion. He will not prolong your exile. He will punish your sin, daughter Edom, and expose your wickedness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There are two places in the New Testament where Jesus is revealed as trusting the Heavenly Father. Both times, the Bible says Jesus trusted the Father during his crucifixion. And that's amazing to me that of all the places, 
we're going to be talking about trust today for a little while. And so my thought was, well, where does it, does it say anything about Jesus? Did he trust? Did he trust the Father? And of all the times in the life that he lived here among us, well, does it say anywhere in Scripture that he trusted God in those times? And yes, two times, but both times when it comes to the crucifixion. There is where Jesus trusted the Heavenly Father. In Matthew 27, Jesus is suffering on the cross as the righteous sacrifice for your sins and mine. And those witnessing this say about Jesus, they say about him, he trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him, for he said, I am the Son of God. Jesus trusts in God, meaning God the Father. The chief priests observe that in Jesus. They look at Jesus being crucified, and they think about trust. Jesus, suffering, and trust are linked together in that providence of God. Jesus trusted God the Father, dying as a willing sacrifice for the sin of the world. He put his whole life into the will of God, and he was raised from the dead as Lord of life. Hebrews 2 is the other place that we read that Jesus trusted God the Father, and that chapter 2 is about the suffering that Jesus endured on our behalf. And verse 12 reflects on that simply saying, Jesus says, I will put my trust in him, the Heavenly Father. The Son of God trusts the Father God through the worst moments in human history in order to bring about the best grace, salvation, and eternal life in a right relationship with the Lord God. Sins forgiven, sinners set free, a new life marked by righteousness and peace. That's the power of trust that Jesus modeled and then gave us as his blessing, having sacrificed and suffered for you. Trust in God. When we trust our lives to God, there is a power to face the worst. There comes a freedom to bring God's good and best into our situations, and we're graced with this new life to overcome our old broken ways in the middle of this broken time in which we live. The Bible shows us that Jesus was the most perfect example of trusting God. And that trust was most evident in the worst moments of the human life he carried for us, the crucifixion. And from Jesus, we learn what trust is. Counting on God so much, he will obey and complete God's will. He is assured that God's will will be done even in the worst. And then Jesus leaves the result to the Father. So our trust in God strives to obey and then leave the results to God, to look for goodness even where God's good is hard to see. Trusting in God is the fourth faith response in the discipline of lament. When we first started reflecting on the discipline of lament, we said lament is more than just being really sad or in great grief. We said lament helps us do something with our grief. Lament is how we bring our sorrow to the Heavenly Father. In the exercise of this spiritual discipline, God's active, gracious, healing presence is revealed to us. Jesus comes to you as the one who died for you. And deep down, this is what we not only want, it is what we are finally made for. The God of the cross, the man of sorrows, is revealed as God with us now, restoring 
us in our experience of the cross we are called to bear. Lament is prayer in pain that leads to trust. It is the practice, we said, of four deliberate faith responses to what has happened to us, four intentional acts offered to the sovereign Lord who has promised redemption and restoration. So to recap, first we learn that to lament, we turn to God instead of away from the Lord. For we are tempted to turn away from God. Satan uses tragedy or loss to isolate us, to separate us from Christ and his church, making us feel alone and incarcerated in our pain and bitterness. But faith turns back to the Lord in confession and a cry for mercy and justice. Then second, we said we bring our complaints to God. We don't let anger or grief or failure shape and define us. We tell God about it, that the Lord might have the final say about all this. We ask the Spirit to help us clearly discern what's going on and what's needed from our Heavenly Father. In our complaints, we also confess our sin. We confess when we have been sinned against and what that has done to us too. We profess also what we know about God's promises. And then last week, we added the third faith response. After we turn to God, after we voice our complaints to God, third, we don't stay in our complaints, but we make our humble and bold requests to our Heavenly Father. We leave our sorrow with Jesus, who suffered all for us. And now we ask, confident of God's grace and character, our most heartfelt requests of the Lord, who delivers us through our sorrow and sacrifice. So how's that been going for you? Have you been trying that out? Have you been practicing trying this discipline of lament a little bit in your life? If you have, you know it, it is a discipline. It's something we have to learn. We, we kind of stumble at it. It takes intention and practice. When we first choose to lament, we're going to struggle with it. And even as we begin to lament, we're going to doubt that it's really doing anything or helping us. So along the way, you may resist. After all, we are a bit scared of tears and sorrow. We try to move past suffering as quickly as we can. Uh, sometimes we'd rather be angry or bitter. Most of the time, we'd rather just be happy. And true, Good Friday does give way to Easter Sunday and resurrection. Joy does come in the morning, but there are nights of weeping. And the discipline of lament is that practice not only for us in our grief, but a way for us to exercise compassion and be able to take upon ourselves the grief of others who suffer so. I know church is a place of joy in the Lord, but also a merciful place where mourning is shared. So now we're up to Lamentations 4, and it continues reflecting on deep sadness and grief. And we have to wait till all the way to the end to get just a little sliver of a reason to trust again. Verse 22, your punishment will end, daughter Zion. He will not prolong your exile. That's all we get. We get verses and verses of continued sorrow. I mean, there was hope in chapter 3, right? God's mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. We're ready for relief and deliverance. But chapter 4 comes right back into suffering and loss, right back where things stand right now. So remember last time we said that that in our faith, in this response of humbly 
and boldly bringing our requests to God. Sometimes we have to wait. And chapter 4 reminds us that we have to wait a little longer. But like Jesus trusting his suffering to the Father, so we trust in the middle of our worst. This is where lament finally takes us. It takes all the way until the last few lines to be told the good news that exile will come to an end. This we can trust. But trust must be lived out in sorrow. We trust the Lord's future restoration, but we live out that trust in our present grief, sorrow, loss, and even the sorrow of our own sin. Striving to trust the Heavenly Father is the fourth faith act in the practice, the discipline of lament. We say, yes, the Lord's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. The Father has our best in mind and heart and prepares us for eternal restoration while nothing separates us from his love. The Lord alone saves us and keeps sin from taking over and taking charge of our lives and our identities and our actions. So what does it mean to trust? To trust God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, according to this chapter, first it means to expose the idols in which we have misplaced our trust. Lamentations chapter 4 reflects again on what happened to Jerusalem and her people leading up to that evil day the city finally fell when the people were massacred and taken as slaves into exile. Their fall exposed what they had been relying on. All that they thought made their lives good and kept them safe and protected them from harm. And verse 1 starts a listing of the gifts of God that had become their idols, had become the things that they had set their lives on, the things that gave meaning to their lives and in which they put their energies and hopes and the things in which they misplace their trust. Verse 1, how the gold has lost its luster. The fine gold become dull. The sacred gems are scattered at every street corner. Gold and sacred gems had become an idol. They stand for wealth and riches. It had become their security. But look where that led them. And what good are they now? Then Lamentations carries on, and after some verses, verse 11, it says, The Lord has given full vent to his wrath. He has poured out his fierce anger. He kindled a fire in Zion that consumed her foundations. Foundations are those things on which we base our decisions and choices those things and habits and values and measures that tell us whether we're doing okay, whether we're pretty good people, where life is okay and we're on solid ground. Jerusalem had forsaken the foundation of God's word and faithful obedience to God's commands. Their foundations had become more about themselves and and assuming God was just there to make them happy. Then verse 12 speaks of the strength of Jerusalem's gates, and verse 20 refers to their king. They had had given their allegiance over to their country and their politics, and this too was a misplaced trust, and all these let them down in the end as well. All to make us ask, what are your idols? Can you think of the idols in your life right now? And you may say, I don't have any idols. But I know you do. We all do. We have pressures on us to bow down to something other than Jesus. 
John Calvin said, the human heart is a factory for idols. So what tempts you? When you say, I I will only have God if I can have this as well. That's an idol. And our lament isn't complete. Our trust doesn't mature until we confess our idols for the dangers and the false gods that they are. We do this because when we misplace our trust, that misplaced trust changes us. Judah's idolatry turned the people away from their relationship to the Heavenly Father. They become people who didn't like the kind of people they'd become. Lament mourns not only what is lost and what burdens, but when we go through the steps of lament, turning to God and bringing our complaints and boldly making our requests, then we are led by the Spirit to mourn where we have misplaced our trust. These comments come from the middle of verse the middle verses of chapter 4. And there, Lamentations 4 describes that because of Judah's idols, look how they have changed. And so we read, But my people have become heartless. The children beg for bread, but no one gives it to them. With their own hands, compassionate women have cooked their own children who became their food when my people were destroyed. Moreover, our eyes failed, looking in vain for help. From our towers we watch for a nation that could save us. Such, such vivid, shocking language. All to say, this is not us. What happened to us? How could compassionate women become cannibals? How could we become so heartless? Look what we have become because we have trusted in false gods. We have turned from being satisfied to live in an obedient relationship to the Lord. We are not who the Creator made us to be. That's what all these verses are describing. So that's what we're supposed to feel here. So when we strive to trust the Lord again, we pause to reflect deeply on what we have become away from Jesus. I mean, is this us? Being selfish, being judgmental, forgetting about stewardship and witness and service. So what is it? What's your idol? And how has that misshaped your heart? That's the first step of trust, of of mourning this. Lament then helps us journey from misplaced trust to rebuild our trust in the only one who is worthy of it, the only one who gave his life for ours. And we begin to open our clenched fists and empty our clutching hands. We place confidence in the way of Christ and his promise to be with us to the very end and reward those who persevere. So now we can take steps, steps of faith away from the cause of our great grief to look for and desire the sovereign activity of God, which is happening all around us, but many times we are too dull to see, to live through what Jesus has accomplished. Trust gives us a strength to say, it may be a hard day, but it's a good day when I can take up my cross and follow. It may be a hard thing, but it is a good thing when I can show mercy and grant forgiveness. It may be an unknown thing, but trust is when I look for that new life that God is giving and making in me 
and letting go of that old life that I'm just hanging on to, defining my life by what the culture makes me define life as. Robert Capon celebrates. He says, if he, if Jesus, has already done it all for me already, why shouldn't I live trusting him? If he has already reconciled my wayward self, why shouldn't I at least try to act as if I trust him to have done just that and to let his reconciliation govern my actions and my relationships and doings? So once trust calls out the idols in our lives, then we are free to practice our trust in the Lord. Remember those verses from Proverbs 3? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. These verses remind us that faith is not first a set of beliefs, but a, a, a practice a set of practices, things we do. Practices found in obeying God's word and his commands of love. Trust is that living relationship where God is God and we are not. God is God on God's terms, not ours. And that union with God leads to practices that witness, that long for, that live in the kingdom of God relying on his sovereign work, trusting his providential ways, committing our work and our stresses and our sacrifices to him because he has our back. It's like the old hymn, trust and obey. Those two things go together and mean pretty much the same thing. Trust and obey, then leave those results to God. It is the Lord's creation after all, is it not? It is Christ's church after all, is it not? And we are his handiwork after all, are we not? I read somewhere, trust is practice when we stop trying to protect, to rescue, to judge, and to manage the lives around us, your children's lives, the lives of your spouses, your friends' lives, because that is just what you are powerless to do. Remember that the lives of other people are not your business first. They are God's business because they belong to God, whether they use the word God or not. Even your own life is not your business. It is God's business. Leave it to God. That's an astonishing thought, but it's a life-transforming truth. Our deliverance is Jesus, but not the idea of Jesus, not the concept of Christianity, but the person, the living, risen Lord, a living relationship with Jesus. That's our deliverance. But when was the last time you made a decision simply based on the fact that God said so, that Jesus said so, that the Lord commanded it, and so I obeyed. Simple as that. Trust takes Jesus at his word. Prayer is also trust. Not just the words and the petitions of prayer, but that holy imagination to say in my prayer time, I am sitting in the presence of the Lord. I'm resting on the Father's lap as a child of God. I bow before the throne of God, imagining that. I belong in my heart and soul to Jesus who receives me and intercedes for me. So then I can go where my prayers take me. I know It is hard to trust the Lord when we suffer. But Jesus trusts the Father as he suffers for us, so much so that unbelievers saw it in him. Because in the end, you know, suffering is not the worst thing. Sin is. 
and his trust is power, power to bring forgiveness. This great good is our invitation to trust in his way. Frederick Buechner blesses us in our trusting the Lord when he says, not at every moment of our lives, but at certain rare moments of greenness and stillness, we are shepherded by the knowledge that though all is far from right, all is right deep down. All will be right at last. I suspect that is at least part of what he leadeth me in paths of righteousness is all about. It means righteousness not just in the sense of doing right, but in the sense of being right. Being right with God. Trusting the deep down rightness of the life God has created for us and in us. I suspect that the paths of righteousness he leads us in are more than anything else the paths of trust and the kind of life that grows out of that trust. I think that is the shelter he calls us to with nail-pierced hands and when the wind blows bitter and the shadows are dark. Amen. We're going to go into our time of prayer now, and as we've been doing through this season of Lent, you're invited to write on the sticks, the popsicle sticks that are in front of you in the, in the racks there. Uh, we've already uh, given our offerings of prayers of adoration and confession and thanksgiving. So today the prayer is a prayer for someone, or even yourself, a prayer of supplication. You may write something like, Lord, I pray for, and it may be something, one of your requests. Or it may be, Lord, I pray for so-and-so, and pray this, and you write that on. And those in the fellowship hall, you may do the same thing, the, the sticks are on the tables for you. And then when, when we are done with that, um, we'll have, the team is going to sing a couple songs, so you'll have time to process, proceed up and put your offering, your prayers of supplication in the baskets up front there or in the fellowship hall in the uh, um, uh, bowls that are by the fireplace uh, in the fellowship hall. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to pray, uh, start with a short prayer, and I invite the worship team up now, and then we're going to start singing. The first song is an unfamiliar one, but that's your time to reflect and offer your own silent prayers and then write on your popsicle stick. And then when you're ready, you can come up, we'll have a second song, and then you may uh, uh, offer your prayers into the basket and then proceed back to your um, seats. Okay? So let me begin our prayer to get us to think about our prayer, our requests, our supplications to the Lord, and then we'll, we'll lead as a team in this prayerful worship time together. Let's pray. O oh God, empty me of angry judgments and aching disappointments and anxious trying and breathe into me something like quietness and confidence that the lion and the lamb in me may lie down together and be led by a trust as straightforward as a little child. Catch my pride and doubt off guard that at least for a moment I may sense your presence and your caring and be surprised by a sudden joy rising in me now to sustain me in the coming then. Hear our prayers together, O Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, Receive our requests and have mercy on us in your name. Amen. So you're invited now to write your prayers on the sticks and as we sing and when you're ready you can bring them up. Like you, and who else would? 
would give their life for me, even suffering in my place. And who could repay, and who could repay you? All of creation looks to you, and you provide for all you have. my hands, lifting up my voice, lifting up your name, and in your grace I rest, for your love has come to me, and set me free, and I'm trusting in your word, trusting in your cross, trusting in your blood, and all your faithfulness.
there's a risk to do that, but it feels good to lean on the everlasting arms. It does. I invite the deacons up now to uh, lead us in our offering prayer. And then during the offering, uh, there'll be a video from the Goes. We, we welcome Jong and, and Masuk and Jessica are here. And then after the offering and the video, they'll speak for a few words about their ministry. And you are invited after into the fellowship hall for some refreshments together uh, to greet them and to bless them, and then also to hear from them of their mission work as well. Today's offering is for missions. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the freedom we have to worship freely in this country, and forgive us for taking it so for granted. I pray that you will be with all of our missionaries and that we will be aware of their needs, I ask that they may feel your love and our love for them. Please watch over them and bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If we could sit down. We all traveled through a long and unexpected road during the last two years. We finished our ninth term well because of your prayers and support. We are deeply grateful for your partnership with us. Before the pandemic, we traveled to many places, but suddenly we couldn't travel except to a few nearby churches. We prayed for God's guidance. In April 2020, we decided to offer our first online training. God began to bring all of our partners back. Within a month after the first training, there were 12 monthly trainings. Each month, an average of 200 leaders joined us. What a surprise it was when Satan used the pandemic to stop all of our kingdom activities. God opened many new doors. Praise the Lord. Of course, we don't think that this will replace our field trainings. We are yearning to get together in person as soon as possible. Besides these leadership trainings, we have continued personal evangelism. During the last year, seven people were baptized, and we are now helping five people on their journey to find Jesus as their Savior. While God has blessed our works, our family has gone through a couple of challenging years. Our ninth term started with an unexpected difficulty with Mizuk's health. We came home for rest over Christmas in 2019. To our great surprise, we found that one of our daughter had a serious mental health issue which needs our continual attention. We experienced an emotional roller coaster dealing with her along with the challenges of the pandemic. In March 2020, Jessica and Julia came to Japan as volunteer missionaries. Every Sunday, we traveled together. When I preached, our two daughters helped the worship with special piano and flute music. Strangely, the pandemic helped us to stay together, and all of the churches where we visited welcomed our presence and asked us to continue our family ministry at their churches. With these unexpected experiences, we have grown together as God's family more than ever before. Jessica is preparing to go back to Japan with us to continue her mission work among children and young people. And Julia will come to Grand Rapids to start her studies at Calvin Theological Seminary in August. We ask you to pray for our next term continually, focusing on the two goals, evangelism and reconciliation. We want to see more people being saved in Japan and beyond. At the same time, we want to see churches and leaders coming together for the glory of the Lord. Our battle with the evil ones will continue. We know that no matter what, God still reigns. To do this, we need your prayers and support continually. 
we will work together to bring glory to God. Thank you for your faithful partnership. So I want to invite you up. Yes, John, good to see you. Why don't you come over here to this microphone here? Okay. Yes, right here. Be good. Yes, welcome again. Thank you. Yes. This morning I represent churches in Japan with masks on. <laughs> and I'm really, I'm, uh, I felt privileged this morning to be among you. I came uh, to Rambar Church with Misu and Jessica. Could you rise? <laughs> Several days ago, uh, Rosemary sent me an email warning me that you're not going to see many families <laughs> this coming Sunday because of spring break. And I answered, I pray for those families who are traveling for their safety. So even though they, we don't see them here, they are in our prayers. Uh, looking back, this year is 35th year for my family to be a part of this congregation. 1987, my family, four of us, except Julia, the youngest one, came to this church as a part of summer intern, annual, uh, yearly intern of Calvin Seminary. And then my family spent three months here during summertime, and Jessica was baptized here. Uh, by Reverend Don Nagan. So probably she is feeling that she is homecoming <laughs> this morning. We were much younger then than now. But now we are much closer to our eternal home than then. And we, we are really happy to see you here this morning. And I don't want to repeat the ministry side because you watched. But I want to present a small gift to the congregation. Because of your faithfulness with us, Right after my graduation, 87, I had internship here, and 88, I was ordained here. And Rambar Church became my calling church and stayed all these years as that. And then my two daughters, one started a volunteer missionary last year, two years ago, and then the youngest one will go to Calvin Seminary and thankfully, Rambar Church decided to be, decided or deciding <laughs> to be their calling church. So we praise the Lord for your fellowship. Probably I didn't tell John anything, but could you come up here to receive this gift? <laughs> okay. This gift, uh, it took 50 years to prepare this gift. Not by us, because our relationship went back to 35 years. But a lady called Mrs. Shimada in Japan, CRCNA started a church planting ministry in Japan, 1972, so 50 years ago. And year after the church planting ministry started, Mrs. Shimada in her 30s, was baptized. And she kept so far 50 years of journey with the Lord. And she is a professional calligrapher. And 
When she heard that we are going back home church, she said, I want to present this gift to your supporting churches. So I brought this morning seven Bible picture card written by Mrs. Shimada. So probably you can decorate somewhere remembering the good things happening in Japan is because of your prayers and support. Thank you. Thank you and blessing. Yep. So we'll uh, put this in the fellowship hall too after so people can have a look at this too. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. blessing. And we'll see you after. Yes. So team, you want to come up? I invite you to rise and body your spirit to receive the blessing of the Lord. So, sisters and brothers, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. Amen. You may go now in the peace of the Lord.